Thank you, Brett. Church family, good to see each one of you. Take your Bibles now and turn me to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 and 4. We are back looking at the story of Moses. If you're visiting with us, we're in a series entitled Meeting with God, where we are looking at what it looks like for people to genuinely meet with God. Our desire is not just to go through motions, but to truly encounter God. And as we're looking at it in Scripture, we're looking at people who have had those encounters and what they've learned and what God has said to them and what has happened in their lives. And a couple of weeks ago, we began looking at Moses' encounter with God. It is well known in regards to Moses and the burning bush is what it is phrased as because he has an encounter with God while he is being a shepherd. And what we're going to see today is that Moses' encounter with God turns out in his response with questions, meaning to, as Moses is hearing what God is saying to him, it's almost as I paraphrase it, are you sure about that, God? How many of us, when we have heard God say something to us through his word, through a sermon, or through even just reading the scripture, we sometimes begin to have questions for him. We begin to try to get out of that situation. God, are you sure that's really what you mean? God, are you sure that's what you really want me to do? Are you sure that I really have to do that right now? Can I not hang on to that just a little bit longer? You mean now means now? You mean sin means sin? You mean obedience means obedience? You know, that's what we're talking about here and how all of us probably at some point, if we've had an encounter with God and meet with God, there's been something that's been challenging to us. There's been something that has probably moved us beyond comfortability that God is challenging us to do something. It's not always challenging us to do something in regards to sin. Sometimes he's challenging us to be obedient to a task that might just seem impossible. And we're questioning if it's even possible for us to do that. And we're questioning God on that. Well, Moses, who ended up being an amazing leader, started out with questioning God in regards to what God was calling him to do. So I'd like for us to read that text this morning, and we're going to pick up specifically in our time, we're going to look at 11 and 12, but let's go back to the beginning of chapter 3 and see Moses' encounter. Let me just give you a little background. Remember, Moses was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He was born to, obviously he was an Israelite, but at that particular time, the Pharaoh wanted to get rid of all of the Hebrew children, the boys, because they were growing in number and they were beginning to be threatened. Uh, the Pharaoh was at that time, and so when Moses' mother had him, she hid him in a basket by the stream, by the river there, and Pharaoh's daughter found him and wanted to raise him as her own. And Moses' sister runs to Pharaoh's daughter and says, Hey, would you like to have a Pharaoh, la- a, a Israelite lady to raise him? Well, she goes and gets Moses' mother. She raises him to the point that she has to give him to Pharaoh's daughter. So for 40 years, Moses is raised in Egypt, in the palace, in the regime, if you will, of Pharaoh's household. And after 40 years, after him being there, he sees one of his Israelites, fellow Israelites, being mistreated. And he comes to his aid, he comes to his defense, and he defends him to the point that he actually kills the Egyptian at that point and buries him in the sand. And from that point, Moses begins to flee from Midian, or flees from Egypt and goes down to Midian some 300 miles away. Now Moses is there. He's 40 years in Egypt. Now he's 40 years in, in Midian. He has got married. He has children. And for 40 years, all his job is, is to be a shepherd. And at the end of those 40 years, unbeknownst to him, unprepared by him, he goes on the other side of the mountain and he meets God. And God assigns him a job, and Moses' questions are, are you sure? Let's read the text. Exodus 3, verse 1. <clears throat> Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. 
And he said, Do not come near. And take your sandals off your feet, for that place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold... The cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, up to this point, as we pause here just for a moment, everything is probably fine for Moses. He's bowed before the face of the Lord. He hears that God now understands the burden of his people, but it is in this point where things are about to change when God begins to say these words in verse 10. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. What did you just say, God? Now, those words aren't there, but I'm giving you some expression that's probably about to happen. But the reason why we're saying that is because of Moses' is Next question, but all of this point, I mean, aren't we oftentimes, you know, we, we won't be able to be delivered and rescued. We're like, Man, somebody needs to do something about it. You know, we say make statements like that, don't we? I wish somebody would just do something about such and such, and you fill in the X, Y, and Z that's there. And that's kind of Moses. He's there. He knows his people are being mistreated. And God is saying, hey, I've heard the cry. I'm encountering you, and it's all sounding good. And then God is saying, but you are the one I'm calling out to go back to Pharaoh. In this moment, can you imagine everything that's flashing before his eyes and his memory? Are you kidding me? i got to go back to the very place. I killed somebody. I go back there, guess what's going to happen to me? Probably going to die, is probably what he's thinking. You're, you're sending me back to the place that, where I was raised and I abandoned them. Now, even to the little side to this here, I want to show you what Moses' thoughts were prior to what we're going to see in verse 12. Why? I want you to see where Moses is not just leaving Egypt just because that he had killed the Egyptian and he buried him in the sand in the very next day that one of the fellow Israelites is questioning him on his authority and he leaves. But there was actually something else that was going on in Moses' life that was beyond just running from this danger. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to see what the Bible says is one of the reasons why Moses is actually leaving Egypt. There is a struggle that was going on within Moses. Because I want you to understand the background of the faith issue that was taking place. Hebrews, which is towards the end of your New Testament, if you're looking for it. Hebrews chapter 11. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is known as the faith chapter, the hall of faith, where all these people through history of the Old Testament are known for their faith expression and why they had trusted God and what had happened in their lives. And Moses is listed among that hall of faith. And I want you to look with me, if you would, to verse 23. And we're going to notice in regards to what the author of Hebrews tells us what the reason is of Moses' leaving Egypt. And we're doing this so you can understand what the mindset would have possibly been for Moses when he's hearing from God that he wants him to go back. Verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. So the faith expression there in verse 23 is referring to his parents. They're hiding him because they're trusting that God's going to take care of him because at that point there was an execution decree that was going out that all these children are going to be murdered. So let's read that again. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You get that? His alliance with Pharaoh's daughter, he's basically reaching the point to say, I'm not your son any longer. Why? Verse 25. Rather than being aligned with royalty, power, Egypt, 
he says, rather though, verse 25, he's choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. You understand the choice that was going on for him. Am I going to stay associated with Pharaoh's daughter and Pharaoh and the pleasures of sin that's taking place if he stays within that household. Remember, he had been raised by his mother, who's possibly been telling him about the Hebrew faith. He understands those things. And now he has a faith quandary that's in front of him at the same time that's going on. So notice what it says here in verse 26. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. So by faith, he left Egypt, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Do you hear Moses' background here? He's recognizing that where he has been reared is now full of sinfulness, idolatry, not true worship. Yeah, he had defended his fellow Israelite, but his reason for fleeing wasn't just because of that. He's recognizing that Christ, understand, by faith, he's looking forward to the promise that had been given to his forefathers. And he's saying the pleasure and the treasure of Christ is far greater than the treasures that he had in his hand. He left it, and he went home. He left treasure to take care of sheep. His faith was letting go of something that was tangible that people would say is wealth to go back, to flee and go into Midian, and yet while he's there, he's not encountered God, understands them. This encounter he's about to have is 40 years, so He had placed faith in God prior to this encounter. So I want you to understand his encounter with God at the burning bush is not his salvific moment. He had had faith that led to that way before this particular moment. Are you with me? So Moses, going back to Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, we understand Moses has trusted in God, believed in God. His faith is what led him to leave Egypt and to leave all those treasures. So now when God is saying, I want you to go back there, understand to go back there is to go back to where the pleasures of sin were that he had left a long time ago to leave a family behind that he saw that was not really his family at all and God is calling him to go right back to the place where he was sometimes God works just like that he saves you out of a situation and then he says you got to go right back there to go tell those people who would know them better than him who would know better than that situation so what is the response what is Moses's question there's actually five questions in chapter 3 and chapter 4 that Moses gives God we're actually just going to study the first two this morning and we'll get the next three next week so God is telling him you're going to go to Pharaoh not just to go to Egypt understand What the command is, again, look at it again in chapter 3. Let's look at it there in verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Not to the second person in command, not just to the army leaders, but I want to send you to the top dog himself. You're going to walk up to Pharaoh and you're going to ask for my people. Now, here is the highest power in the land. And God is saying, I'm going to send you to him. And what's Moses' question? Let's look at the very first one in verse 12. Verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I, he says. Moses' first question. Who am I to go do this job? I mean, think about what he has done. He has been there in royalty, and now he's just been leading sheep. So Moses is questioning his capability to say, God, are you sure you've got the right person? Anybody felt that way when God has challenged you to do something? Are you sure? Who am I to do these things? You're questioning your competency or your capability to be able to do what God has called you to do. He's been a prince, and then he's fled And now he's just been a shepherd, and now he's been there for 40 years, and little does he know, little does he know that all of his preparation is exactly what God had needed him to do to be ready to lead 
the people. Who would think that leading sheep would prepare you to be able to lead people? Now, when we think one of the reasons why maybe this is a daunting task for Moses is because of the number of people that he's about to have to lead. This is not just a few people that's here. It's a large mass of people that he's, God is calling him to lead. So let me show you this to you. If you turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, let's see just how many people that we're talking about that would seem a little bit overwhelming as opposed to leading sheep, as opposed to leading people. You say, what is similar of leading sheep than leading people? They're all stubborn. Don't take offense to it. I love you. So God has called him to shepherd people, to lead them. And one of the reasons of being a shepherd is so good is because the shepherd knows his sheep. The shepherd knows the sheep. And the sheep, once they know the shepherd's voice, they lead and they follow and they understand that the shepherd cares for them. But look how many people, Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. This is fast forwarding in time a little bit after the 10th plague, but it tells us how many people we're talking about. And the people of Israel journey from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them. So 600,000 men plus women and children. We're easily talking about 1.2, 1.3 million people. Plus it says a mixed multitude. That's a wonderful side note, by the way. Which means that the mixed multitude is mixed multitude of other ethnicities. Possibly even some of the Egyptians who have recognized that God is God. And they're leaving behind Pharaoh and leaving behind all the other things. They say, we're going with you. That is an amazing sermon in itself, by the way. And so here is Moses, back to chapter 3, you're leading sheep, and then God is saying, hey, by the way, I want you to go lead 1.3 million plus people out of Egypt, and you're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to say, I'm going to take all these people out of here. So now in this particular moment, he's saying, how in the world? You do the math. How in the world can I organize something so vast as all that? How is it possible when they're all under slavery to do those things? But here's the thing. Moses is looking at everything about himself and he's not trusting in the ability of God because what is God's response? What does God simply say? Because in each of these questions, we have God giving a response to him. And what's the first thing God says to him there in verse 12? But God says, I will be with you. Now remember, in the holiness of God that we looked at a few weeks ago, the transcendence of God means he's above everything. He's above everybody and their knowledge and their power. He's above God, of every person in every particular way. And so now God is saying imminently, I'm going to be with you. Remember, this is the first time that according to history that God has spoken in some over 400 plus years. And so now God is speaking and saying, hey, I'm going to be with you in this circumstance. And what else has God said? He gives him a promise. Look at it there at the end of verse 12. I'm going to be with you, and this shall be the sign for you. Really, that word kind of means a decree, not just so much a sign. This is going to be the decree I'm giving you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Here's a promise God's saying. Hey, look, you're going to go, and I'm going to tell you right now, you're coming right back here. You will serve here. You're going to be right here. So listen, here's what God is saying to Moses. No matter, Moses, what the situation looks like in your mind, no matter how difficult it seems, you're coming back here. Now, what's Moses to do in that particular moment? What should he do? He should simply trust and say, if God is the one who has created all things, and he is the God of my father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I should trust him, and I should be able to say, he's with me, and so we're going to do this, and we're going to go. But how many of us, how many of us are just like Moses in this moment? That we're looking at our ability, our competency, and our capability, and forgetting the God component altogether. That we're leaving God out behind. Yeah, we'll say that God is with us, but yet we're trusting in our power rather than in trusting in the supernatural power of God. It's like what Jesus says to Paul in 2 Corinthians. When Jesus says to Paul, it's like, in your weakness, in your weakness, I can be made strong. So may we understand that here, all of us in this particular moment, this is where we need to identify with Moses as believers in Christ. If God is calling you and me to a task, 
If he's calling you to obey something that you're afraid to do or you're unwilling to do, we need to be reminded that the promise that God gave to Moses is actually the same promise that each one of us still have by Jesus Christ himself. You remember what Jesus said to his apostles right before he left? In Matthew 28, 20, he says, I will be with you to the end of the world. Now I ask you, what is it that God is calling you to do? What is a task that maybe that's in front of you that you're afraid to do? The person that's next door that God is burdening your heart to go talk to and you're afraid to do that. What is God saying? I will be with you. A sin that you're struggling with that you know that you need to lay down. You said, I can't do this. And what does God say to you? I will be with you. For a marriage that is struggling and you're saying, I want to throw the towel and you say, it's impossible. And you say, but I can trust him. What does God say? I will be with you. For the coworker that you've been having difficulty with and you're saying, God, I'm having a difficult time. I don't know if I can do this anymore. And what does God promise? I will be with you. God's promise of his presence is what we all need to be remembering here. Our question in this particular moment is not so much our competency. Our question is not so much about our capabilities. But our question is, will we trust the promise of God's presence in whatever it is that God is putting in front of us? God chooses the weak. God chooses the low to make himself great. Paul says it this way. In 2 Corinthians, he says, Let the man who boasts not boast in his own doing, but let him boast in the Lord. Moses had nothing to boast in, but it was all about God, but he was questioning it. And I don't know exactly where you are, but I know that God has given this word for a particular reason. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what the task is in front of you that maybe you're running from. I don't know what the sin is that you're hiding and you're afraid to let down, but I'm just here to tell you from the word of God, God promises to be with you in whatever circumstance it is. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you want to throw the towel in because it's just too difficult with your kid, and God's saying to you, I will be with you in that moment. God will never abandon us at all. Are we willing to hang on to that promise? Because in this particular moment, Moses hasn't even taken one step to head back to Egypt. But God had already promised to bring him back on the other side. And the promise is still for us. The promise is for us. I can't promise whatever it is that God is telling that you need to do. I can't tell you that it's always going to turn out in the good. How many of us have been obedient and sometimes it's turned bad? That we've taken steps that are risky and challenging and being courageous to do what God's called us to do. And sometimes it backfires on us and we're wondering if God has called us to, to, to really do that. Do we understand correctly? Did we misunderstand it? But what God may be doing in all those moments is stretching our faith and growing our faith. Is that not the point anyways? The point is not necessarily to make us comfortable. The point is to trust in God that our faith would actually increase to believe that he actually is in control of all things anyways. So Moses questioned it, and maybe you are this morning, but I'm just here to remind you that God's promise to Moses is the same for us. He'll be with us. Well, what's his second question? Moses has another one after God has told them that, and he promised him, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to bring you back right here. You would think that would be enough, right, to be able to say, hey, you're going to be able to bring us back, you're going to bring me here on this same mountain, this very place. I mean, not any other place, but the place he was most comfortable with. God's going to bring you back right here. I say, okay, you got it, God. Let's go. Let's do this. Nope. Now, don't throw darts at Moses. Because how many of us have not just questioned God one time? How many of us have questioned God two times, or three times, or four times, or 20 times? Probably a lot of us. You know, we'll question God, and, and here's the picture. And this right here, you know what this actually displays for us? God is very patient and long-suffering with us. God is very patient, let me put it to, this way, to endure our lack of trust. God is patient and long-suffering to put up with his own sheep. And here's the moment. So God has promised, hey, I'm going to be with you. And it's almost like Moses is sitting there and I can just see it. 
I got another question, God. So what does Moses say? What is his question? It's right there in verse 13. So you would think, okay, man, I'm promising to do everything for you. You're going to go there. You're going to come back, and you're going to be right here. All those million plus people are going to be here. No, what does Moses say? But if I come to the people, now you notice how he starts? If I come. Anybody get that? Not, okay, God, I'm going to go, and I'm going to, they're going to ask this question. No, so Moses is still contemplating whether he's going to actually do this or not. So if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So Moses' question here is, what's the name I'm going to tell them? Now you say, what's the big deal about that? Why is that just a, a question? So understand, Moses is trying to find every particular reason here. He's working through if he's going to go. Look, we've got to put ourselves in the culture of Moses' day to understand this question. Let me first of all point out to you, Moses doesn't ask, who is his name? He asks, what is his name? There's a big difference, and here's the difference. In Egyptian culture, remember this is where Moses had been reared most of his 40 years of his life, and then 40 years there in Midian, but his whole early childhood, his young manhood, had been in Egypt. And according to Egyptian culture and the religion of their day, they worshipped many different gods. And their gods was associated with a particular quality or characteristic in regards to what they were capable of doing. So when Moses is saying, if I go there, and they're going to ask, what's his name? What Moses is implying is, God, if I'm going, they're not necessarily asking who your name is. They want to know what quality of the person of the God I'm saying is going to bring them out. They want to know what you're capable of. You with it? And so God is going to answer the what to give him that. So, for example, in Egypt, in their worship of multiple gods, one of their famous gods that most of you, many of you probably have known because if you watch movies, they reference this one quite frequently, the god of Ra, their lower god. Understand, we're not saying that they are gods because we believe there's only one true god, and that is God Almighty. But they would say the god of Ra, for example. He's the god of sun, the god of power. And so for the Egyptians, if they want to know what was his name, they would know that if they were referred to god of Ra, that he would have the ability to bring the sun for the crops or whatever it may be. The, god of, the goddess of Isis, for example, or Isis is another one that they had. And she was the goddess of peace and medicine. So if they had a need, or what was his, her name? It would be one that would bring peace. And so they would refer to those particular goddesses. So when Moses is saying to God, hey, what's your name? What quality or characteristic can I tell these people that is being sent to them? And God says to him, look at the text now in verse 14. God's answer to them. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. This text is powerful in the essence of the name of God. I do not want you to miss the simplicity of the statement, but the potency that therein it contains. Remember, we're talking about the quality and the characteristic of what the name means. This is the what component. We don't walk around and say that we serve the I am, although it would be very right to say so. For God to say that I am what God is saying to Moses to tell to the people, because they're wanting to know, look, they're in this situation. What's going on with their situation? They're afflicted. They're oppressed for 430 years. And so if Moses is walking in and says, hey, I have a God that's going to rescue you, and they're going to say, well, what's his name? What quality of this God you're talking about is he going to bring to the table that we haven't been able to get out of this situation? And Moses can stand based upon what God has said. It says, you tell them, God says, tell them I am has sent you. What does that mean? 
I am is not I was. I am is not I will be. I am is not I'm going to possibly do these things. I am means that I am. That means that I am means that I'm not just going to deliver you, but that I always am. His being is enduring. His being is never ending. He never has a beginning. He never has an ending. To be I am means that he's absolute in his character and his being, that there's nothing above him. There's nothing below him. I am means that he is the greatest of all. To be I am means that he's always present. To be I am means that he's all-knowing. So Moses, you go tell them I am sent you. God has alluded to his characteristic of the I am. To be I am means that God is I am in 2000 BC. I am means that he's there at 6000 BC. To be I am means that he's present in 2019. To be I am means that in 2040 or 2050, whatever he allows this earth to extend to, he will be there. That's what it means to be I am. He is, he was, he will be. There will be nothing that will change about his characteristic. There will be nothing that will change in his essence and his being. He is. And if he always is, that means he always knows. If he always has been, that means he always will have power. He is the I am Redemption Church family. And the I am is the one that said to Moses, I will be with you. So the same I am that's going to go and rescue them is the same I am that's going to be with Moses when he walks over there and he talks to Pharaoh and he's in that journey and he's telling the people to come. It's the I am. And may I say to you, the I am is who is with you today in 2019 in your own faith commitment, in your own walk with Jesus Christ. He alludes to who the I am is. Go back with me to chapter 3, verse 7, when God is speaking to Moses about the situation that I am. And remember, 430 years. Listen, I want to make very clear to you. Just because they were suffering for 430 years did not mean that the I am was not present. You may be walking through suffering or difficulty, and that does not mean that the I am is not with you. There was a greater purpose in their affliction. There was a greater purpose in their suffering that the I am was working out. God was doing something for his greater good. According to Genesis chapter 12, when God is speaking to Abraham, and he gave him the promise. He says, look, your people are going to come back to this land, but they're going to suffer for 400 plus years, but they're going to suffer because the punishment that I have to bring upon the opposing nation has not yet going to be fulfilled, but it's going to take that long of a time for your people to stay where they are for me to carry out my will. Understand this. We are not the only person in the universe. We're one piece of a greater puzzle. And so, although that we may have to walk through difficulty or walk through suffering, understand that the God of the universe is still the I am. And because he is the I am, he is working out an amazing amount of amazing pieces for his greater good and his greater glory. So what did the I am allude to in verse 7? The Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. What's the first thing the I am has done? He knew. He saw the 400 years of affliction. What else? And I have heard their cry. And I know it. The I am hears it. The I am sees it. The I am knows it. So when we say that we serve the I am, we understand that God is the God of all the senses and all the abilities. So if he is the one who always hears, he always sees it, he always knows it, that means that our God that we serve is the omnipresent God. He's in all places and all times. He's the omniscient God. He's all-knowing. And so when God, when Moses is saying, what's your name? Do you have a name that I can tell them that's going to help them to have hope? Do you have a name that I can tell them that it's going to help them to realize that I'm not just blowing smoke? Oh, and it's like God is sounding back with the trumpet, with the megaphone. You tell them I am has sent you, Moses. And then, if he's walking into those people, remember, 
Moses has not been there with the suffering and the struggle like they have. So if he walks into them and they're wondering who they are, what you're going to say to them? God actually answers both aspects without Moses asking the who. God tells him the what, the I am that I am sent you. And then he actually gives him the who. Look at the text. Verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And God also said, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Now understand what just happened here. God has told them the what, I am that I am. And then God makes the connection with the who that the people of Israel would know. God would know, the people of Israel would know about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And God is now saying to Moses, hey, the I am, that's the same one that is the God of Abraham and the Isaac and Jacob. So the what of the ongoing and the I am being and the sustaining one, you tell them it's the Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the Isaac and Jacob. That is who is coming your way. And in that moment when Moses would stand before them and they would talk about the characteristics of God and he would let them know to say, hey, the same one that's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, his name is Yahweh. That's his name. It's the I am. And then they would know we're talking about the same God. Yahweh, Yahweh as it actually is pronounced there in the Hebrew. Some of your translations have the word Lord there, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Anytime you see that it's there in that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, when God is saying his covenant name of Yahweh, is in the, <clears throat> usually in the illusion of the time when God speaks that name, when he is demonstrating his power. This is the first time that this name is mentioned in Scripture. It is mentioned many times after this point. But don't miss it. If you look in your Bible and you see the capital O, capital O, capital R, capital D, it is the allusion to the covenant name of God, and God is saying, I am. You and I, church family, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Yahweh in your life. You have the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And why would that be so important to bring that illusion back to the people of Israel? And it was this. Because what did God promise Abraham? What did God promise Isaac? And what did God promise Jacob? He promised Abraham. He said, I'm going to make a great nation of you, and they're going to come, and they're going to live here and be in this promised land. Well, guess where the promised land was that God was going to lead Moses to? The same thing. So when God promised Isaac, he says, I'm going to give the same covenant to you, Isaac, as I gave with your father, Abraham. When God gave the covenant to Jacob, he said, I'm going to do the same thing that I've made a promise to Abraham. And now we're to Moses, and Moses is saying, look, the God that promised you is the God that sent me. So Moses, in this particular moment, has to say, am I going to trust God and who he is and his character? Or am I going to trust my emotion? Tune in real close to me. Listen to me. Believer, you and I in our walks with God, our dependence is not on our emotion. Our faith is rooted in the character of God. So your emotions are high one day and they're at the bottom of the barrel the next day. The reason why this text is good is to let us know the God that you worship today is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And his character does never change. He is always going to be the same. So here, whatever task is in front of Moses and whatever task is in front of us, our root, our faith is not rooted in my incompetence or my fear or my inability. My root is trusting in God. Who are you and what is your name and what did you say and what did you promise? And that's what I'm going to bank on. And so Moses hears this name. And after he hears the name, what does God tell him to do again in verse 8? 18. What's the word? I'm sorry, 16. What's the first word? Guess what? 
the command didn't change. It's almost like he's going back to say, God, are you sure? And God says, okay, I'm giving you two answers now. And this again, I want to tell you the same thing. Go. Go do this. So as he's told him to do this, now what is he telling him to do? Now we're about to see some promises. So God is now even going to further heighten this word that he's given back to Moses. Not that, not that God has to do this, but God in his grace is going to give him some things that will help him in regards to if he's going to be obedient or not. In verse 16, so God tells him, So you go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, there it is, Yahweh, the I Am, the God of Abraham, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and of Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of the land to the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, how would that sound to people who are suffering? And they're not having milk and honey. They're scraping by. And God is promising, hey, you're going to go to them, Moses, and you're going to tell them, I'm going to deliver you up out of this affliction. That's the first promise. What's the second promise? Now, if in Moses' mind, he's thinking, wait a minute, I'm going to these people. How in the world? Are they even going to listen to me? What does God promise next? Verse 18. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt. So here's what God is now. Remember what, what Moses is saying to God initially? Who am I to go? Are you sure you've got the right guy? God is saying, I'm going to go with you. And now you're going to go to the elders. And when I do go with you, they're going to listen to what you have to say. In Moses' mind, he might be thinking of everything about him in his past to say, do they even respect me? Are they going to follow me? Why would he think that? Go back to chapter 2. Let me show you how our past can actually be daunting to us in the present. Chapter 2, remember after Moses had defended his fellow Israelite, after he had killed the Egyptian, put him in the ground, and the very next day he sees two different Israelites having a disagreement. Pick up with me, chapter 2, verse 12. When Moses went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man, he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And he answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you get it? And now God is telling Moses to go not just to the people, but to the elders. If the people are saying that they're not going to trust us, what in Moses' mind? They're not going to believe me. How many of us have been haunted by the things of our past, thinking it's crippling us from doing what God has called us to do in the future? Let me tell you something, that's a great thing of what the enemy likes to do to us. God says do this, and the enemy says you can't do it because you did that. God says do this, the enemy says you can't do that because you failed at that. The enemy is a liar, and he wants to keep us crippled in regards to what God is calling us to do. And Moses is saying, you go, I'm going to deliver you out of the affliction and tell them, and they're going to listen to you, and then, what else does God promise? Go back to chapter 3, verse 19. Pick up verse 18, and they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. But know this, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. Now if you stop right there, what would Moses want to do? <laughs> He's not going to listen to me. So why in the world should I go? So God tells him, so I'm going to stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go. Remember, what did God tell Moses at the beginning? You're going to go and I'm going to bring you back right here. So Pharaoh's not going to let you go. I'm going to strike him with wonders. And then verse 21. These are all futuristic. Tell him what's going to happen. And then... I'm going to give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters so you shall plunder the Egyptians. I want you to get the picture here. God is telling Moses, Moses, I want you to go 
And I want you to lead the people. I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell them, let the people go. And Moses said, who am I? And God says, look, I want you to go tell them it's the I am who sent you. And then you're going to go talk to the elders. And when you go, I'm giving you all these promises. I'm going to deliver you out of the affliction. The elders are going to listen to you. And then you've got to go tell to Pharaoh. But by the way, he's not going to listen to you unless I do something. So I'm going to solve that for you as well. So when you go, I'm going to work mighty wonders so he's going to let you go. And when you do get ready to go, you're not going to come out there poor. You're going to come out there mighty, mighty taken care of. And you're just going to walk up to people and say, can I have some silver? And they're going to say, yes. Can you walk up to people and say, can I have some gold? They're going to say, yes. If you walk up to someone and say, can I have some clothes? And guess what they're going to say? They're going to say, yes. Can I have your shoes? And they're going to say, yes. Can I have something to eat? They're going to say, yes. So when you leave out of there, you're going to have everything you need. Now, what makes you doubt that? When God said, I'll be with you. In Moses' eyes, the situation seemed impossible. In Moses' eyes, it was beyond doable. But God is saying to Moses, I am can make the impossible possible. The message today is very simple from this text. The first two questions that Moses has, he's questioning what he can do. But may I say to each of you this morning and to those who listen by stream, the question is not what you can do. The question is, do we believe what God can do? And I believe that maybe some of us in this room have been crippled in our lack of believing in the I am. Some of you may be crippled because you're struggling to trust that God can help you overcome a struggle, a worry, an anxiety. You've been crippled because you're doubting whether or not that God actually can help you do what he's calling you to do. I can't list every scenario for you. But I can tell you that I think this is where God wants us to stop today. And to you to fill in the blank to say, I want you to ask yourself the question, what am I not doing that God is asking me to do? What are you not doing? That God is asking you to do? Is it a sin as a believer that you know that God is asking you to lay it down? You say, you can't. And I'm going to give you the right answer to that. You can't. But God can. Your relationships that are struggling, you can't. But God can. Your ability to be bold in the workplace, you can't. But God can. Your ability to raise your children right, you can't. But your ability to take a step of courage, you can't. But are we going to trust the I am? Are we going to trust what he's calling us to do? Today, I think that's just simply it. I don't know where you are. But today, the message is to trust the I am. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never asked Christ to save you, the character of God is still true. He is the I am and he knows your situation, but here's the difference. Until you ask Christ to save you, the I am is not in you. But today that can change. You can call out to Jesus for salvation and you can trust God to be the I am in you. What is it that God is asking you to do that you need to trust Him to do? Let's every head be bowed and every eye be closed. Our musicians will come forward. Today we're looking at Moses' life to see where Moses met a real God and God gave him a challenge and Moses questioned. Maybe some of you in this room I've met with the Lord in the mornings, or even maybe today, and God is reminding you once again of what it is that He's calling you to do. And the question is today, not about your ability, but are you going to trust God's character? 
Father, in this moment, as we will respond to your word through song, and through prayer, and through commitment. Lord, I don't know every person's issues or needs or worry in this room. But Lord, the truth of who you are, the truth that you spoke to Moses, the truth of your character that was going to be true for the people of Israel is still the same for us. You promised through your son Jesus that you would be with us always to the end of the age. And there may be some in this room, there may be some who's listening by stream and they've had your leading, they've had your conviction where you have challenged them to take a step of faith. Maybe you've challenged them to let something go. And they've questioned you on it just as Moses questioned you. But today we're just being reminded that you are the I Am. You are the one who promises to be present. You are the one who promises to be the enabler and to give all power. We may look at a task and look at something in front of us that may seem daunting. As Moses looked at leading 1.3 plus million people but it does not change. You who are the God of the universe is able to help us. So God, some in this room may need to take some steps of faith today, this week. Maybe something different with their job. Maybe something with their family, their relationships. God, I thank you that just as you knew what was going on in the Israelites' life, I'm thankful that right now you know every need of the people that you've called me to shepherd even though I don't but I'm thankful that the character of you is consistent so Lord today be the I am for your people let us rest in your character and in your goodness and let us do what you've called us to do just as you commanded Moses to do we pray this in Jesus name Amen as we stand as we'll respond, there'll be people here to receive you. If you have a step or an action or something you need prayer with that the I Am is asking you to do, we're here for you. You can come pray. I'll be here. John will be here. Miss Jackie will be here to pray with. So you obey whatever it is God's spoken to you today. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.